Hello everyone, good afternoon. So I'm Nuno Oliveira. I'm a software engineer at GeoSolutions, mostly working on the GeoServer ecosystem. GeoSolutions, as you may know, we are a company with open source at our core. GeoServer, MapStore, GeoNetwork. These are some of the examples of the open source products we deal with. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, open source, not only we embrace it, we also participate in innovating and moving it forward, okay? This, uh, this talk in particular is about Inspire, supporting GeoServer, and as well, how we can map complex data in different output formats and integrate with different kind of data store managements. So in the past of years, this was very focused on Inspire, and now we have developed a set of new tools that will allow to support the Inspire use cases, but to go beyond them, okay? So in terms of support of Inspire in GeoServer, so well, we are compliant with, uh, of course, GeoServer is free and open source, so we can just download and use it without any licensing, and we are compliant with a bunch of standards, of course, from the, uh, well, if we do the parallelization, we can actually do it on the next slide. So we have in terms of the normal services, which are usually the most complicated one to, let's say, to comply with. So we support WFS, web coverage services, and now as well the OGC API features. So the recommendation to use OGC API features to publish Donald services was approved, where GeoJSON becomes central instead of GML. I will say that's one of the main differences. In terms of view services, we support WMS and WMTS, and transformation services can be uh, obtained with WPS and the transformation process. Okay, so this presentation, we are going to focus on the nodal services, which means that we have our data stored somewhere, we have a target schema, and some way we need to make both of them correspond one to each other, okay? So this is how we use it to do things. So basically, we have the application schema module that will allow us to read our data from a database storage. We'll have to define a, a mapping and application schema, and Sorry, I need to start the counter. And we'll basically have the data source, we'll have application schema in the middle, we have a target schema, and we define a mapping for both. And then GeoServe will take care of doing everything. So along the time, there were several improvements that were implemented. There were several data sources that were supported, Postgres, Oracle, Solar, MongoDB, you name it. And basically, the way it go was I have my data, I have a target GML schema, and well, uh, I will obtain my mapping. So this was working great until the last couple of years. Why? Because you know that GML kind of lost the, let's say, the first place. Now we are discussing about GeoJSON. So now what? We have all our data sets mapped and we need actually to produce GeoJSON. Not flav a flavor, uh, GML flavor GeoJSON, but a pure GeoJSON with about structured data. And not only it needs to be efficient to produce, but as well to query. And it doesn't belong anymore to WFS. It also belongs now to OGC API features. And we don't use any more relation databases. Now we use MongoDB. So when we are using application schema, we have the tool to help us defining those mappings. That was AIL. Uh, so the current plugin available for application scheme on AIL only supports AIL 3.5. Let's see if before the end of this year we can actually upgrade it to support AIL.4, because when AIL migrated to AIL.4, it kind of broke all the plugins, because the, it was quite a significant uh, a change in the, in, the, in the way things were tied up together. And uh, yeah, so long story short, right now, we have our data source. We want to go with our data to a target schema. We need to have application schema in the middle. We can use L to help us out. But still, one way or another, we have to define mappings. Our mappings go from the data to the target GML schema. And we started to notice that this had several issues. So for all the examples I will show so far, I will use this Meteo Stations use case. There is a real use case with this name. That's not the same. This is a simplified one, okay? It's basically three tables, station, observations, parameters, and they have a relationship between them. So a station has several observations, and each observation has a parameter. So the first station from Alexandria has two observations. One is for temperature, one is for wind speed, okay? a very simple relation model. So, 
it's time to go one step back and to look a bit at what we are doing. So initially, we have two needs. So we have our data storage and we have a data modeling. So someone stored the data because someone is producing it. We don't know it comes from sensor data, whatever is the reason. We have our data storage and then we have our data modeling. So someone sit down and say, look, this is the way we should publish our data. There is, of course, the Inspire one, which is very well known, but there is other organisms that do exactly the same thing. And then we need, of course, to publish the data. And publish the data is not only make it available, then we need to make it efficient to be queryable. Because we, if we have a, a production application, we have 1,000 euros querying the data set, the system will need to be able to handle it, and we'll need to be able to efficiently translate the requests. So that kind of stuff. And kind of, we need to map everything together, right? And the way it is done now is that basically, the person doing the mappings need to take everything in consideration. So he needs to understand data modeling, he needs to understand data storage, because you'll need to understand there is a relationship between the data, everything. You'll need to understand how the data will be queried, and you'll need to understand how the data will be built. So this means makes quite a bit of a complex task to achieve. So, and of course there is, I keep forgetting about it, there is still GML was leading the dance because everything we did was with GML in mind because WFS was mostly GML. So, you know, that was the way things were done. And we see now that with the new OGC API features and uh, similar ones that GML is definitely not again the, let's say the main format. GeoJSON is kind of slowly taking out that place. So, well, exactly. This is the GML, how the example look like. So basically, we want from the data, I have my station table with my station name colon, and I want it to become the common name attribute on my target data model. Okay. This is great, but if you want to produce a GeoJSON, well, this is kind of an extra tab that is useless. And of course, this forces you to know about the structure in the database, which is definitely something that you may know, not, not know about, because who knows, maybe it's a completely different organization that tells, look, there is the relation database, and there is the modeling, and you just have to do the mappings between them. So, basically, what we have sit down together and think about a way where we can lower the entry ticket for this. And to use computers for what they are good for, which is dealing with abstract numbers, with abstract stuff. So we think, look, data storage, data modeling and publishing, that belongs to humans, because that's the stuff they are good at. Understanding how I should model my data to store it, what should be my data model to publish it, and the way I want to publish, with the WMS, WFS, OGC, API, whatever. And we build a component that take care of the rest, and that company, the smart data loader, which will be able to look at relation database, and of course, I keep mentioning relation database because they are the most well-known ones and the ones we actually support for now. They are very well designed and very well mature system. So when you have a relationship, usually it's very well defined. I know, look, my station tables depends on the observations one. The observation ones depends on the perimeter ones. So the computer can perfectly understand that structure and build the domain for us, right? So. Let's automate all that step, and that's basically what we did. But now, we need a second step, because with the smart data loader, it means that, great, everything is automated, so it reads the domain model, and it gives us the domain model. But how do we make whatever we obtain in that automatic way correspond to the target output we are expecting? This is where, where the second tool comes out, the features templating mechanism, okay? So, how does this mean in terms of workflow? It means that right now, we have our data, we have our target modeling. So smart data later will basically look at our data model, will walk through it, and automatically build in memory an efficient streams of features, okay? They will be complex, they will be relationships, they will have everything that's on the, on the domain model. And then, for each service, we'll have features templating, which will allow us with content negotiation to say, look, if the user requesting this as this particular context, then we want to give to him this GML, or this GeoJSON, or this, this JSON-LD, which is now also supported, or even this HTML. And the nice thing about this is that this now goes beyond Inspire. So all these tools that were very specific to Inspire, and you know, in, 
in the practical way of life that only get, was getting investment for Inspire, now is using in a lot of other, uh, let's say, systems. I don't know, for publishing maritime data, because we want to have a nice HTML output for very old clients that want to integrate. So, Smart Data Loader is now a free and open source your server extensions. It can be downloaded. And basically what it does, describing is quite simple. It looks at your database, it will bulk your structure and it will tell, look, this is the domain model I was able to extract from your data space. Are you happy with it? If we say yes, then it will be in memory, a streams of features that way. And it will take care of make sure they're efficiently represented and that when we try to access the attributes to retrieve the data, to mention them, it will transparently do, uh, do, do all of that for us on a style, on a query we send, on a, any aspect that uh, may enter the system. Of course, uh, this is a video. It should play normally. There we go. So basically, our first step is to add a data store. I cannot see very well from here. Yeah, you can see it well. Basically, we have to provide the database where we have our data storage. We provide the access to the database, of course. Okay, so now we created our connection to our PostgreSQL database where our main data is stored. Now we go to Smart Data Loader and basically, okay, we have to define a name for it. We select our database or select our root entity and it build the domain model for us, okay? Look, this is the relationships I understood. We can do some proning like, and we publish the data it detects the geometry, the spatial, and that's it. It's done. So before this, before reaching this state before, we had to find the target GML schema. We had to define an application schema mapping. We had to know very well how the data was related together. We had to define your the mappings, testing them, publishing them, and so on. In less than 30 seconds, we just published that data set, right? So the only piece we put aside for the moment, which is the game changer, is that we got rid of the target schema. So at this stage, or, and we'll see it now, so it doesn't matter how much relationship or data has, as you will see now in the GML output, there we go, we have a complex structure, okay? Of course, the schema that is here match the relation, the, the relation schema on the database, okay? And as we can see, we can do the same for GeoJSON. So, there we go. We just were able in a couple of clicks to publish our complex data schema model in different output formats, and of course, we are still tied up to that target, to that, sorry, to that domain model that we defined on the database, okay? So now is time to take, let's say, care of the second part. So now, okay, we are in Inspire, and we are mandated to actually respect that very schema. So how do we do it? Well, that was a very tricky part, too. So we come up with the features templating mechanism, where basically we wanted two things. Look, we don't want to be tied up a lot to the target modeling, to whatever. We know very well our domain model, so we know we have stations, we know we have observations, we know parameters, we know their values. So we want to be able to use those attributes. We want to be able to take our output format, just put it in whatever place it is, and start to, to name the attributes there. And it's up to the computer, because that's what they do well, to understand that and make sure it efficiently retrieves the information it needs. Of course, it's not, let's say, a straightforward thing to implement, but in terms of functionality, it's quite powerful. So that's basically what we did. So a features template is a what you see is what you get approach. We'll see how it works in a couple of seconds. And it is integrated at this moment with OGC API features, WFS, and WMS, okay? We'll see later how we are going to deal with uh, content negotiation. And it's super efficient, why? Because it's dealing with an in-memory uh, stream of features that were built by the very already efficient application schema. And this is another very important point. 
if you already, if you already modulated all your data in application schema, so if you already did a lot of investment, guess what? You can just use feature templating on top of it, right? So, uh, okay, this was again, thank you. So this is an example of what the template, the JSON template will look like for our Meteo Station's use case. So basically, we'll just, look, this is my JSON. I start writing on a notebook and I say, look, here, I want my source to be the stations table. My identifier is the ID attribute. My geometry is the position. My name is the common name. Ah, wait, here I want to use a SQL function. I want to do a string concatenation. Here I want the location, but you know what? I want in a, to a WKT format, so I apply that function. What we see is what we get, exactly like it, right? So we can see here in more detail. So we can see that Basically, what the template engine will do is interpret our template and will just produce the output we want. And of course, you will be able to understand the request. So if we say, when we get this JSON on your open layers application, whatever, if you say, look, give me all the stations where the value is only 30 degrees, you will be able to translate that back to the original data source and to return it back to you, okay? So this is a video, I will not show all the video because I'm running out of time. So, okay, we developed an UI to deal with the feature template, with the features template themselves. So basically we're able to, of course, to write them down. It's very similar to the styles editor of your server if you have a user. And okay, this is, I can accelerate a bit, okay. We have our first template. And this is the important bit. We also wanted to have like a sandbox where we could actually try out our template. So I wanted to be able to say, look, go to my data source, select that feature, and let me edit the template, see the changes in real time, that kind of stuff. And we have some kind of, let's say, some type of formats that are tricky. For example, GML, which needs to be evaluated against the schema. So we can perform a validation here. And even for formats like uh, JSON-LD, we are also able to perform a validation there, okay? I will not show all the video because I'm running out of time. So creating templates, we have an UI. Validating the templates, we have a sandbox. And we have the last missing bit, which is content negotiation. So we have quite a powerful tool now where we have an efficient tool to read our data structure, to build an efficient stream of data, we have the features template that allow us to map that data, and now we are missing content negotiation, maybe because we are experimenting a new type of service, maybe because we want to differentiate between users. So there you go, we can define, uh, let's say, content negotiation based on either, I don't know, whatever may be available, based on request. For example, here we say that, look, for the, if the request parameter is a WFS, and if my layer is the GeoJSON one, then I want to use the GeoJSON output format, okay? Use cases I like. I will show some of the use cases that kind of use this. One of them is the boreholes of BRGM, where basically we publish around one million or 10 million, so I never remember what the, the test case you did here. And basically, we are very, E easily able to publish that data set, that complex data set, in an efficient way in WMS. And uh, we actually experimented with JSON-LD, so embedding the context in the GeoJSON. And uh, of course, we were able to query it. This was a system that was published, actually got real users querying it, and it worked quite well. The second one is a bit more advanced one with the Norwegian Public Role Administration, where they had a huge amount of data stored in the MongoDB, and here we had to make your server, no, uh, let's say, no SQL. What does that mean? That you do a WFS request, we don't know the schema. We'll have to build it on the fly with whatever data we are receiving, which means that, of course, you cannot obtain yet GML, but it works quite well. So you can get a bunch of complex data stored on your MongoDB, you can do queries. If the attribute exists, it will not complain. You can use it for styling. So the styling will skip if the property not exists. Anyway, if you have MongoDB, you can give it a try. And that's all I had to say. <laughs>